Well, thanks so much for attending today's session, everyone. We are all experiencing um, the the this occupational the impact of occupational disease currently in the wake of this pandemic. And one positive outcome is the global societal learnings that we've regarding risk assessment and control measure as they've become sort of part of our common social vernacular. Um, and um, it's our job to harness this uh, culture shift and in some awareness moving forward on all our prevention efforts for occupational disease, whether they're acute or, or this longer latency and chronic. We felt it was really important to begin with this theme today of impact in the face of occupational disease. Um, in my first days at OCAL, uh, I had the honor of attending the McIntyre Powder Intake Clinic to interview minors and their families and try to piece together their exposure and work histories. And it was my first time in a 20 year plus career as an occupational hygienist um, to ever look at exposure assessment from the other side retrospectively. Um, I met Jim Hobbs and his daughter Janice, the founder of the McIntyre Powder Project that day, and they remain my heroes and the face of occupational disease that motivate me along with others you'll meet today. Um, and I hope they will inspire all of you in a shared passion for occupational disease prevention. Welcome our COO who has been leading our efforts with large cluster projects will be moderating today's um, session. And we invite you to join over the next four Fridays um, for this October knowledge mobilization change and action streams as we work together to prevent off disease. Uh, so Dave, Dave's a former uh, workers compensation lawyer on the legal aid clinic system and for unionized building trades workers. And he has experience in both individual legal casework and policy work and occupational disease issue, including having been nominated uh, by the Ontario Network of Injured Workers Groups to represent unorganized workers um, on the WSIB's Oct Disease Advisory Panel in the early 2000s. So without further ado, it is my honour to introduce Ron Kaluski, Ontario's Chief Prevention Officer, with some words of welcome. Uh, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me, and I, I bet that Donald Trump wishes that he ran his fundraiser this way this morning. So, anyway, it's nice to see everyone. Um, you know, David, Dave Wilkin, uh, Sylvia, hi there. Nice to see you. And uh, and certainly, Kimberly, thank you for inviting me to this um, to October. I was I was indicating that. Um, I think this is this is my third um, time that I've had the opportunity to speak, as well as um, at the springtime as well. And you know, as as Kimberly said, the um, we're experiencing a real interesting time. And you know, just as we thought that we'd got a handle on it, the um, the second wave has certainly come in, and um, and it's probably going to be. Um, a little bit more challenging than it was in the springtime. And, um, you know, out of all of these challenges and opportunities, we've we've learned a lot. And, and I think, um, you know, as, as prevention has taken a whole new profile, um, I see it within our own ministry. I see it in um, the... Um, uh, the horizontal nature of what government has become. It's, it's learned it needs to rely on others to be able to get the job done. No longer can we be in silos, which is a good thing. And of the over 200 guidance notes that have gone out to employers by sector, um, the, the whole concept of risk assessment, control measures, hierarchy of controls, things that you know, I'm sad to say, even with all the effort that prevention has gone in, um, many people didn't even realize the importance of those. But now there is that reality that people are looking at. Gee whiz, we can actually work to eliminate hazards in our workplace. We can actually uh, um, uh, set up a series of controls that actually um, allow workers to work safer, which is what everything that we're really attempting to do. So, you know, we also have the opportunity to use this heightened awareness to shine the light on the burden of occupational disease. And that, and I think with COVID, it, it's, it's now recognizing that, you know, diseases, um, even like the common cold or the annual flu, uh, can be better managed in a workplace. No longer 
is it acceptable to come to work ill? Um, and I know advocacy and so on. Um, hopefully, we will get to a point where people don't feel that they have to make a choice about being sick and coming to work and infecting others. That we can get to a point where people will feel comfortable and not be unduly penalized because they feel they are a threat to others and have to stay at home because they have a cold. So that that's one thing we can hope for. And workplaces are important settings to target the prevention of cancer and other diseases. And uh, I'd like to, I, I applaud um, the work of OCAO for what they have done um, over the past number of years um, with the whole issue of legacy cancers and legacy diseases. And I also applaud the work that we're doing in preventing those. Our job is really to ensure that people 30 years from now um, remain healthy and we need to start now. So um, we can't do this without partnerships and you know the partnerships that we have uh, put together both with uh, within OCAL and the partnerships that you have established within the labor movement and other areas is really important. And we really need to work together as we have with the Occupational uh, Disease Action Plan since 2017. You know, some of the work that we've done had been highlighted in the Auditor General's report. It said it was great that you created an Occupational Disease Action Plan with recommendations. Now finish it. Um, hold our feet to the fire. Let's get it done. Let's move forward. And, you know, some of the things that have come out of the Action Plan include the annual communication campaign, excuse me, to raise awareness, um, the toolkit to raise awareness and prevention and control of hazards, respiratory hazards, including asbestos, silica, um, and isocyanates. Um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be really important when we release the five-year strategy, there's a real focus on a number of areas that I think will lend itself to the work that past, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, we've also seen on January 1st, the um, ministry uh, committed to review Regulation 833, um, and it was replaced and uh, put into effect on uh, uh, January, July 1st, uh, which was a new and revised regulation that uh, redefined the occupational exposure limits on some 36 chemical substances. So that, that, that was a good thing. And, um, you know, we've also focused on resources on diesel engine exhaust uh, for mining, construction, municipal sectors, and, and just resources for all sectors and workplace agents that cause allergic reactions that irritate the lungs. So the ministry and system partners are going to continue to build on those accomplishments of the Occupational Disease Action Plan, and you'll hear more some update on ODAP um, later today, and Nancy Bradshaw is here, I believe, um, taking part in this, uh, this important series of webinars. <clears throat> and um, so just, just before I conclude, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the strategy. So the, our first strategy went out in 2013 and ended in 2018. Um, and the Auditor General took a, a long look at the strategy and you know, her words were very telling and sobering and cutting when she said, you had a strategy, but you never measured its effectiveness. Um, while Ontario may be the safest jurisdiction in Canada, you really don't know why. Um, and that's really, that, that's something we really want to focus on in our new strategy. And um, it's, for the most part, it's completed, and we thank everybody for their input. But it'll be released um, for 2021. We held back largely because the um, various reviews of WSIB, the Demers Review on Occupational Disease, we anticipated the Metron inquest being completed last year, but it's not yet. And uh, obviously the uh, Spears Review of, of the WSIB. So we wanted to make sure that those reviews were complete so we could incorporate um, any of those recommendations into our into our strategy. So I can tell you now that the strategy has four objectives and 25 activities. Um, those four objectives um, are going to focus on training. They're going to focus on small business. They're going to focus on 
um, ensuring that that knowledge is transferred and translated in a manner that people will absorb, accept, and most importantly, the objective is going to be found. the The fourth objective will be founded on um, um, and making sure that everything that we do is evidence based, outcome focused, and measurable. And this will move us towards which which we have been endorsed by the Prevention Council and the government to move health and safety towards more of a public health model where it's all evidence-based and that what we are doing is founded uh, on good and solid, good and solid science. So this, this uh, we're going to be sharing this strategy with our system partners um, in its complete form. I can tell you it'll only be 12 pages long. It's not going to be a great big book of of words. It's going to be something that um, we are going to measure and we are going to ensure that um, it's it's overall arching purpose and, and it it is demonstrated in the graphic illustration and the strategy is to reduce injury, is to focus on occupational disease and to focus on mental health. So all those four um, strategic objectives and 25 activities are all um, um, there to be able to reduce those from happening um, and and to make measurable results. And, and obviously, OCAO is going to play an important part um, with the strategy, as with all other uh, our system partners. And there's going to be a neat, neat little graphic in that strategy that really defines the whole system. And the whole system is not just uh, the Ministry of Labor. Um, it's not just WSIB. It's not just our, our SWAS and health and safety associations. It's got to engage everybody. It's got to engage labor. Um, it's got to engage uh, uh, businesses with health and safety organizations within. Um, we want everybody to see themselves in this strategy. So it just doesn't come out as another um, uh, uh, another strategy of the government or another or Ron's strategy or the CPO strategy. It's going to guide the whole system. So we all want to see our uh, see our part in it. So I appreciate that. So um, you know, I'd just like to thank Kimberly for the invitation. I'd like to thank Ocal for um, your continued pursuit um, of not only justice but fairness and and uh, your work in the in the front forefronts of occupational disease. So enjoy yourself today and and in in future. Uh, the future series. Um, and um, again, I want to thank you. And uh, I understand Dave Wilkin is is the keynote speaker beyond me. So Dave, good luck on this. Um, and um, thank you again, everyone for for the opportunity. All right, thanks so much, Ron. I, uh, Dave was going to thank you, but he's getting his slides up. So I so appreciate your time and your anytime. Leadership. Anytime. Uh, appreciate it, everyone. Have a good weekend and stay safe, okay? Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, so today, uh, we're gonna give an overview of OCAO's work on occupational disease clusters, uh, investigating uh, clusters, uh, starting off with just a general overview of OCAO's uh, approach uh, to these situations. And then uh, going through uh, the big projects that we've been working on over the last several years for which we've received uh, some special funding uh, through the uh, prevention office uh, namely the McIntyre Powder Project uh, with respect to uh, Northern Miners, uh, the GE Peterborough workers, a plastics plant uh, called uh, Pebra or Ventra Plastics now, formerly Pebra Plastics in Peterborough, uh, the Kitchener Rubber Workers, um, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Stelco Steelworks in Hamilton, uh, and then another one that we we're just uh, starting on uh, over the last couple of months, a uh, foundry in the Sudbury area called Milan Casting. And then uh, just a, a wrap up and questions after that. So there's a lot of uh, ground to cover and uh, we will uh, do our best to, uh, to stay within our time frame here. A couple of general uh, facts about OCAL. Uh, we were founded back in the uh, early 80s by uh, the Steelworkers Local 1005 in Hamilton uh, at the Stelco Steelworks uh, and physicians from the McMaster University Occupational Health Program and uh, later uh, grew into a, uh, a permanent and uh, 
grounded uh, organization with seven clinic locations across the province and a satellite office in uh, Peterborough currently working on the uh, disease cluster there. Uh, each clinic has a multi multidisciplinary team of uh, contract physicians um, and uh, occupational health nurses, uh, occupational hygienists, ergonomists, and admin staff uh, who work together uh, on our, our files of different types. And that's the same uh, general model that uh, we have in the cluster investigations. Our uh, board of directors is made up of uh, representatives of uh, organized labor from uh, different sectors of the economy and community representatives, including the Ontario Network of Injured Worker Groups and uh, 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 in recent years, uh, the legal aid clinics that represent uh, injured workers in their compensation claims and also workers in uh, health and safety uh, work refusals, those sorts of situations. Uh, we are uh, the only designated health clinic under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, which allows the Ministry of Labor uh, through the Prevention Office to provide us with funding uh, for our regular work and for our special project work, uh, which is money that the ministry bills back to the WSIB. It comes out of uh, the employer WSIB premiums, not uh, tax money. Uh, but we are at arm's length from uh, both the uh, WSIB and the ministry, double arms length from the WSIB. Uh, our, uh, our services are provided to uh, Ontario workers and uh, are broadly in line with the system goals as laid out in the uh, Occupational Disease Action Plan. We have uh, five types of service that we usually uh, provide. Uh, medical diagnostic reviews, so this is really a, a determination of what is the proper diagnosis of a, of a condition and uh, is it work-related? What does the science and uh, medical evidence say about the possible work-relatedness? Uh, group services uh, that are usually provided to unions or at the uh, uh, request of a joint health and safety committee, always with uh, worker involvement in the request though. Uh, looking at uh, workplace conditions that are ongoing. So uh, doing uh, hygiene uh, consultations, uh, ergonomic consultations, and so on. Uh, an inquiry service where, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, uh, just a general question about uh, can an exposure be related to a medical condition, we try to answer those uh, quite quickly uh, as an inquiry. And then uh, outreach and education, for public awareness, but also to uh, physicians, uh, as we'll uh, mention later, um, and uh, to uh, um, uh, you know people in the in the labor movement and so on, and then uh, research services, uh, including um, original uh, studies, and uh, oftentimes in cooperation with uh, external uh, academic researchers brings us to the topic of uh, occupational disease intake clinics, which really is a, a blend of all five of those services where we're looking at uh, individual cases uh, at the, uh, uh, the larger picture of uh, work exposures uh, in workplaces um, that uh, brings them about and uh, seeking to interact that whole time with uh, academic researchers, uh, local physicians, uh, to stay in touch with the involved workers and uh, community members. So a typical intake component, as on that last slide, or a typical uh, intake clinic, is an event that, uh, that we have over uh, one or more days uh, where we ask people to come in. Uh, and uh, and uh, it is a sort of uh, a community event uh, for the involved uh, workers, uh, usually organized by the, the union in the workplace uh, together with us. Uh, and then we have uh, um, a sort of uh, orientation session uh, to start off with, uh, register them uh, into uh, our system and also uh, uh, into a uh, database uh, uh, in some cases. Uh, so the, the McIntyre powder uh, intake clinic of which uh, that was a picture is a, is a prime example of that. Uh, we as a health clinic um, operate under the, uh, uh, the rules of the uh, Personal Health Information Protection Act. So uh, we get consent from the involved workers or, uh, or their uh, heirs 
And uh, we need that in order to collect, use, and disclose personal health information and never uh, disclose any identifiable uh, individual health information without uh, consent. Uh, we then have a, uh, an individual health history taken, usually with a, a directed uh, questionnaire uh, based on the, the type of work uh, involved. Uh, do individual work histories for each person, including their other employment uh, outside of that particular workplace, and uh, questionnaires regarding their occupational exposures, both uh, in the target workplace and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, we also ask people typically to bring whatever historical information they may have uh, about documentation, about the workplace exposures in the plant. Uh, so it may be uh, copies of uh, company or MOL uh, documents with uh, hygiene measurements, minutes from uh, Joint Health and Safety Committee uh, meetings. Uh, and then uh, we also are now uh, looking into the uh, pollution reporting um, uh, records that are kept by the government uh, in terms of uh, identifying amounts uh, and types of uh, uh, hazardous chemicals uh, and other ingredients that have gone into a, a plant. So we're currently, because of the COVID crisis, uh, working on a uh, this intake process like this uh, remotely uh, with uh, together with Unifor Local uh, 1987 in Peterborough, which represents the Ventra Plastics uh, workers, and uh, more about that uh, particular uh, project uh, very soon. So we uh, we then take that uh, take that information and uh, you know try to take a more global view of what are the health conditions that are jumping out there. Uh, do the research on the possible work relatedness of those uh, uh, conditions. Uh, in some instances, as you'll see, uh, these result in uh, uh, papers or reports on those uh, general issues uh, that we publish to our website, and some of which we're going to uh, uh, try to put, uh, get published in peer-reviewed publications uh, in the future. Um, we uh, uh, organize uh, the information about the workplace processes and uh, uh, try to make that coherent uh, and uh, and usable. So pulling out the different uh, measurements of uh, of exposures from various reports and uh, getting those into a form uh, that uh, that can be used both in our own work uh, on uh, individual files, also in uh, uh, in uh, sharing with uh, outside researchers with the WSIB and uh, to, uh, uh, in appropriate cases, put into a uh, historical exposure report regarding the entire workplace. And we'll discuss those uh, some more as well. Uh, we do individual hygiene and uh, medical assessments, again, uh, independent from the WSIB when uh, requested by workers, uh, survivors, or legal representatives. Uh, that's uh, generally done when a WSIB claim has been uh, denied and they are wondering about an appeal. Uh, we will uh, look at those uh, look at those issues, and our uh, hygienists and doctors uh, produce individual uh, assessment reports. Um, in some cases, uh, people do uh, want to uh, wait uh, until they have such an assessment before filing a claim. And uh, in those situations, we would also file the claim on their behalf with a form eight uh, from one of our doctors. Uh, but uh, we do uh, uh, encourage people to uh, to file claims uh, early early in the process uh, in order to uh, get the WSIB also working on the related issues and uh, to uh, in some ways ultimately lighten the load of our work uh, so that uh, we are not uh, doing independent uh, assessments of. Uh, for workers' comp purposes for claims that the, the WSIB is going to allow based on their own uh, investigation, for example. Um, and then, uh, again, sharing information with our system partners and uh, academic researchers, never individual information without uh, consent. Finally, feedback to uh, workers, to local physicians uh, uh, in an area where there there's are health conditions of concern and, uh, and to the public. Uh, now, this uh, approach, we think, uh, addresses several of the elements of the report uh, recently uh, published a couple months ago, 
uh, or put out by the Ministry of Labor that they contracted from Paul Demers uh, of the Occupational Cancer Research Center. Uh, Paul is going to be pre presenting at our next October event next Friday at 10 a.m. on uh, all the results of his report. So I won't go through all of those. Uh, but uh, you know, one of the issues is just uh, the uh, uh, the the lack of uh, uh, good uh, investigative procedures uh, for occupational disease clusters. Um, at Ocal, uh, you know, we firmly believe in our approach. Uh, I know a lot of uh, uh, union uh, folks would uh, definitely say, and I would take me off my OCAL hat for a moment as a workers' comp lawyer, say that uh, you know the, the past history of the WSIB and the Ministry of Labor in uh, investigating clusters directly uh, is not something that would uh, give uh, give people a lot of confidence uh, in the results of those. And again, we are independent uh, in that sense and, and take our direction from the workers in the workplace on these on this intake clinic work. These are, in effect, uh, clusters that have been noticed by the union or by individual workers in a workplace and are reported uh, to us, brought to us for investigation to look at as a, as a group. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the results so far, we have uh, uh, a bit of uh, an under capacity issue, as you'll see many uh, clusters still awaiting our uh, investigation uh, for which uh, you know, we need more resources uh, to, to get them all rolling. Uh, but our current situation, according to uh, uh, Paul Demers, is that approximately 95% of work-related cancers, and these are the ones that are most well understood uh, in terms of uh, their both their work-relatedness and their uh, their uh, their occurrence, uh, their numbers. Uh, about 95% of those go unrecognized every year uh, with uh, obvious implications for, uh, for prevention efforts, uh, both in terms of uh, rendering those diseases uh, without any uh, financial uh, costs for anyone other than the, uh, the involved uh, workers and families and the taxpayer supported uh, healthcare system, uh, but also just simply in terms of uh, recognizing uh, what and where the hazards are and uh, whether we're doing a good job of uh, preventing them in the first place. Uh, it's also a, uh, um, a, uh, a great injustice, obviously, to have those, uh, to have those costs uh, and uh, uh, foisted onto the, the individuals who've already uh, been unfortunate enough to, to suffer the diseases and uh, makes uh, really, again, Speaking now in my personal capacity as a lawyer, really makes a mockery of the of the historic compromise uh, at the founding of uh, of uh, workers' compensation, where workers have given up their right to sue for a uh, a certain um, and uh, um, accessible compensation system that was from the very beginning meant to include occupational disease. Uh, the other benefit of our uh, approach is that uh, it uh, it directs the research. Uh, regarding towards looking at what are the unknown elements of these known clusters that are reported to us by, uh, by workers. And again, unfortunately, historically, a lot of the effort in uh, investigating uh, clusters, uh, which I put in quotation marks, has gone into trying to convince people that the cluster that they've observed in their own workplace is not really there. Uh, but as, uh, as People eventually took them more seriously as OCAL has gotten involved in several of these uh, situations and been able to draw in outside uh, experts and, and academics. It has uh, uh, really relentlessly uh, proven true uh, that the, uh, the workers were right in the first place uh, in their observations and that the, uh, the initial um, uh, scientific uh, responses to that uh, were uh, really um, uh, because they did not uh, take the investigation seriously or were somehow in some other way flawed, uh, really did not, uh, uh, were not up to snuff. Uh, and there's a little subcategory of this that uh, I would call uh, cut and run prevention, uh, which is taking the idea of it is most important to, uh, you know, to prevent diseases rather than to later investigate them and uh, compensate them turning that into uh, turning our backs on those who have already suffered uh, with the idea that we can uh, much more fruitfully 
uh, direct most of our efforts into uh, looking looking towards the future. And uh, this is really, uh, uh, you know, an odd way to take uh, take care of the people, uh, workers of the province, to uh, to say that yeah, we're we're very concerned about you right up until the moment that you contracted deadly disease. Uh, but it also is uh, is something that uh, uh, really winds up being quite convenient uh, for uh, uh, for uh, researchers and uh, bureaucrats in some cases in terms of. What they get to spend their time on and uh, what they what they get to ignore. Uh, so it's vitally important uh, that our our prevention work in the province is rooted in the real world and in what we know for a fact has happened, and to uh, to bring justice uh, to those uh, workers in those situations. And then uh, again, uh, finally, uh, one of the deficits that. Uh, uh, Professor DeMare's uh, notices is uh, uh, comments on extensively is uh, you know the ability to get good exposure information, uh, which uh, is necessary not only for uh, looking at individual cases but for uh, research efforts. Um, so we're we're very much uh, focusing our attention now on. Uh, again, what are the ways that we can feed back the work that we have been doing uh, in uh, uh, in accumulating and processing uh, exposure information that's brought to us by workers and unions, and in some cases employers, uh, and uh, and feeding that back out to uh, academic researchers and to the uh, the wider health and safety system. Historical exposure reports. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of these in a minute, but. Uh, uh, these are uh, reports documenting uh, the work processes and exposures uh, uh, throughout a workplace. Um, there's a, a, a method uh, that was uh, worked on, developed, uh, pursued by Ocao hygienist uh, Sonia Lau at GE Peterborough in the worst affected areas of that plant. Um, we were, again, unfortunately not able to complete that for the entire plant as a, as a, just as a matter of uh, our resources at the time. It was uh, picked up by Dale and Bob DiMatteo, uh, both uh, uh, health and safety uh, professionals, and uh, Bob, a longtime member of Ocal's board, who uh, continued to pursue that on a volunteer basis with a group of uh, workers, uh, uniform retirees from the plant, and uh, uh, who were then able to secure some uh, assistance from uh, Unifor National. Um, it's a participatory project with those workers to, uh, to sit down go through, map out the different processes in different areas of the plant in different time periods and, uh, and uh, get it all in writing and to link it with the documentary evidence from the time. Uh, so the things I mentioned a moment ago, uh, MOL inspection reports, Joint Health and Safety Committee min minutes, uh, um, previous OCAL work, uh, which uh, becomes important in some of our future uh, examples, and uh, material safety data sheets. The McIntyre Powder Project is uh, by far our uh, our biggest uh, currently, and really uh, you know one of our uh, um, one of our biggest undertakings uh, to date. Um, these initial numbers I'll just cover over quite quickly. Obviously, we are seeing a lot of uh, respiratory diseases, cancers related to the mining environment. Uh, uh, Janice Martell, who founded uh, uh, an outside group called the McIntyre Powder Project that eventually uh, made uh, contact with the uh, steel workers who asked us to, uh, to do this and take clinic in the first instance, uh, did it because of the possibility of neurological conditions. So you'll see on slide uh, 11, um, uh, Parkinson's disease from which uh, Janice's uh, father suffered, uh, ALS, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, and then other um, uh, symptoms uh, without firm diagnoses. We've seen quite a few of those in the, uh, around at this point. So the information on the slides is uh, about a year and a half old, but uh, we're, we're just slightly over those numbers now with about uh, 500 currently active files. Uh, 501 was the, uh, the number that we had uh, yesterday in our, uh, in our database. And cardiovascular conditions, which this again points uh, to the issue of uh, you know what's the benefit of, of investigating these clusters. Well, when this group of workers has come forward and uh, saw a very high level of the cardiovascular conditions and 
a sparse previous research uh, um, of just a couple of studies. One of them had pointed to uh, an increased rate of uh, cardiovascular disease in um, uh, McIntyre powder exposed minors um, has led into a very uh, um, uh, fruitful um, area of uh, research on uh, nanoparticulates, which these are. Uh, so it's very cutting edge, although the, uh, the exposures happened between the mid-1940s and 1980. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's uh, led us into some very uh, important insights, I think. We're doing ongoing work there, again, uh, around uh, 500 files uh, that we're working on. We've published group reports addressing health conditions and mining exposures, including the McIntyre powder uh, our hygienists have been working on the Ontario Mining Exposures Database uh, to uh, prepare it, remove um, uh, duplicates and other areas from the data and uh, make it usable for us in the individual files, as well as something we can feed back to, uh, uh, to uh, outside uh, researchers and the health and safety system. And then uh, we're looking at the previously denied claims, filing new claims where appropriate. We've been having uh, regular meetings, uh, public meetings in the, in the cities most affected. Uh, so returning to uh, Timmins, uh, having a meeting in uh, Elliott Lake where we do public information sessions, uh, bring some of the outside researchers as well, such as uh, 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 Paul Demers and uh, Andrew Zarnke, who you'll hear from in a minute, to present on their scientific work. Uh, discussing the, uh, uh, what's going on with the cases, sharing our generic uh, scientific reports, uh, et cetera. And then uh, working with uh, outside researchers, as mentioned. Uh, so last October, we, we reported on uh, Dr. T. Guadadi's review of the uh, pre-existing research, uh, where he found that the best available evidence was uh, indicating McIntyre powder causes neurological effects and uh, Andrew Zarnke, who presented on the, uh, the chemical and physical composition of the powder. So we published a, a number of uh, group reports uh, as well, that you'll, as you can see, uh, many of which deal with uh, exposures that are common to Ontario mines, not just related to the powder. And we're, uh, we're going to continue expanding on that uh, work uh, as uh, both in terms of uh, analyzing the uh, the science underlying uh, the approach to adjudication of claims, uh, where that's become outdated and so on, but also just in terms of uh, cataloging what are the, uh, what are the, the issues of concern, uh, that including things that need further research. And with that, I will um, hand over to, uh, if you put up slide 15, first to uh, Janice Martell, um, from the uh, McIntyre Powder Project, who's going to uh, discuss uh, a study that's been uh, released uh, this past year uh, on McIntyre Powder, uh, conducted by the Occupational Cancer Research Center. And then she will hand off to uh, J.P. Mrachek, uh, who is a, a, a workers' comp rep at uh, uh, Steelworkers Local 6500 uh, for Valley Inco workers. Uh, who's going to talk about uh, non-malignant respiratory diseases, uh, which uh, are suffered uh, by minors in large numbers, and uh, some of the active issues there. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, I am Janice Martel from the McIntyre Powder Project, and I just wanted to give a brief update. I know that there's a lot of presenters um, on the research that's been done on McIntyre Powder um, and its health effects in the last year. Uh, in keeping with the theme of the face of occupational disease clusters, my pictures in this are going to be of actual miners. And these are two miners from Denison, um, a mine in Elliott Lake when it was up and running back in the day. McMaster University uh, bone aluminum measurement study. So in the fall, uh, based on our McIntyre powder database at OCAO, uh, randomly selected 15 miners from the Timmins uh, mining camps to come to McMaster University to have the aluminum in the bones of their hands measured. Um, we selected them, uh, you know, relatively equal, equally by random uh, numbers uh, in low, medium, and high McIntyre powder exposure categories. It was difficult to get that many miners to come down, not because they didn't want to, but many of them are uh, too 
uh, elderly and frail to come down, but the ones who did were uh, quite grateful for the opportunity. They participated in cognitive functioning tests uh, with Dr. David Cohen, and then um, they had the the aluminum in the bones of their hands measured through this tandem accelerator. You can see this gentleman um, who gratefully allowed me to use his photo. Um, you would have that sleeve uh, that would be filled with water to make it tight against uh, so that it wouldn't move inside this machine. They would be a, a brief um, dosing with some uh, radiation and then go to a different machine to measure. There's little spikes that happen with aluminum and they measured aluminum uh, uh, against ca the calcium. So aluminum to calcium in your bones um, uh, ratio uh, for the 15 miners. Uh, the biological half-life of aluminum is 10 to 20 years and these miners had not had aluminum dust exposure from mac powder for at least 40 years. It stopped in 79, but some of them had been exposed, you know, uh, they went to a different mine, so it may have been 72 that they stopped uh, or earlier. Um, and the aluminum levels in their in their bones of their hands were measured to a similarly aged control group. And those study results are going to, are currently being submitted for publication, so they should come out uh, soon. Uh, this miner is my dad, Jim Hobbs. Uh, he is the reason that the McIntyre Powder Project exists because I love him and I was concerned uh, when he developed Parkinson's and I learned about the McIntyre Powder exposure that the McIntyre Powder itself may have done harm to him because we had no family history of Parkinson's and we wanted to know those answers. Um, so the Occupational Cancer Research Centre uh, in 2017, the WSIB commissioned this study. Uh, the Occupational Cancer Research Centre, OCRC, has the mining master file, which is a collection of about uh, 90,000 um, records on 90,000 Ontario miners from 1929 up until about 1987. Uh, so when the miners went and got their annual chest x-rays, they would have a number assigned to them. Um, that number would be associated with their chest x-rays and they kept these files, which are now, um, they are in, the, the records are stored with the uh, WSIB, um, the Workers uh, Safety and Insurance Board, and the uh, OCRC has a digital copy of the mining master file. So what they did was they linked up the mining master file with uh, records with Ontario Health Database is called uh, ISIS, I-C-E-S, I believe. Um, and the ISIS database starts from 1992 on. So they were able to match up, I think, somewhere around 37,000 of those records. And then they compared the neurological disease rate. So these would be hospital records, long-term care home records. Every time you go see your doctor and use your health card, bits of data go into this database. Um, and what they uh, did was they compared the neurological disease rates in minors who received a McIntyre powder exposure, minors who did not receive McIntyre ex powder exposure, and then the general Ontario population. And what they found was a statistic statistically significant link between Parkinson's and McIntyre powder exposure. Um, so we were uh, right to be concerned. Um, and the WSAB, as a result of that, developed a new adjudicative advice document. So the the OCRC released, they, they finished their study in March. The, the WSAB released the study in early May, and then on June 23rd, they developed um, this adjudicative advice document, um, and they have started granting McIntyre powder-based Parkinson's claims. Um, the OCRC also found elevated rates of Alzheimer's and motor neuron disease. 70% um, of motor neuron disease diagnosis using the diagnostic codes uh, are ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But these were associated, uh, the higher rates were associated with the mining environment itself, so compared to the general population, not specific to McIntyre powder. And the OCRC emphasized the need for research into that and possible links to traumatic injury, diesel exhaust, arsenic, radon, and whole body vibration. And uh, the, the other point that I think is really important is that further research is needed for non-neurological conditions. So when the, um, when the WSAB commissioned this uh, study with, with, from OCRC, they focused on, on neurological conditions only because they figured it would take somewhere like 10 years to get all of the conditions done. But there is a need for this for two reasons. One, we are seeing higher numbers 
um, of uh, things like respiratory conditions, cancers, cardiovascular conditions in these minors. So uh, when we're looking at the group as a whole, as a cluster as a whole, um, and we're also seeing that research is supporting the needs uh, for studies of these health conditions as well. Um, Andrew Zarnke and colleagues from Health Canada and the University of Evry in uh, Paris, uh, France, um, did a characterization of McIntyre powder uh, that was spoken about at last uh, October. And they had, uh, they noticed that fine and ultra fine particular matter is what it was basically comprised of. And these are the kinds of things that, um, you know, have been associated with cardiovascular disease um, and with nanoparticles, they can get to the brain. So you are concerned about, you know, neurological disorders and that sort of thing. And the way that these miners had to inhale the aluminum dust, they were compromising their lungs just before they went underground. So right at the start of every shift, they'd be inhaling this very fine, fine and ultra fine particulate matter that was specifically designed under patent protection by the McIntyre Research Foundation, who are mining executives, to get deep into your lungs um, to theoretically combat silicosis, which didn't happen. We've That's been debunked. Um, and so right before you go underground, you've compromised your lungs and now your lungs are that much more vulnerable to your normal lung clearing mechanisms to the dust that you get underground, the diesel exhaust, um, you know, uh, silica dust, uh, radon things. So I think that there's, there's evidence based that we need to look at this. And there was a Western Australian minor study in 2013 um, uh, that studied and they found uh, elevated rates of Alzheimer's as well as uh, cardiovascular disease. And the, the main issue is time is really running out to give these minors the answers that they deserve to know while they are still alive. Um, I was very proud to that, that this work with the McIntyre uh, Powder Project resulted in the fact that we now know that Parkinson's uh, is linked to McIntyre Powder exposure. Um, but my dad didn't get that answer while he was still alive. He died in 2017. And this gentleman that you see in the picture here, you may have seen him featured in the Toronto Star series uh, on occupational disease called The Uncounted. Um, there's a video of him there speaking about uh, his, his own health issues, his COPD. Uh, he's still alive. And there's, uh, you know, a few hundred of these minors still alive. And they deserve to know these answers while they are alive. I had an email from, I get a lot of people, you know, just expressing their thanks that, that we started this project. Um, and I had an email from one of the sons of uh, one of the first minors who was granted for his Parkinson's claim. And I'm just going to give you a small segment of the email. I have been following your efforts related to minors and their hardships. It is unimaginable knowing what we know now and what our parents were subjected to. It often makes me wonder what we are doing today that future generations will question. You have affected all of the people who love their minors, kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, siblings, and so many more. You are a hero to many, many more than you may realize. And I'm not trying to be a hero. I'm trying to get the answers that these people deserve. And I think, you know, we heard Ron Koleski uh, talk about the moving to a public health model and looking at science and evidence base. And what I want to say, and on behalf of the McIntyre miners and the other occupational disease clusters, is that these workers are the evidence. Their bodies hold the evidence. And the one thing, the one, as much as I respect the Demers report, and I, I really do, and the, the need for science-based, we have to look at, 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 at the, these workers to find out what you need to what you need to investigate. If if I hadn't stepped forward, if I hadn't done this for my dad, nobody would have studied the McIntyre powder miners to look at the neurological diseases. And now we have that answer. So the you know OCAL really and the, the the unions have their their ground their ear to the ground, listening to what these workers are saying. So we have to look at these workers, see what we're seeing, and then feed that back to the research. And I will stop talking now. And thank you very much for listening. I will uh, hand it over to J.P. Rochek from uh, USW Local 6500. I was asked today to speak a little bit about non-malignant respiratory disease, and, and I'm going to give you uh, an advocate perspective. So it, it really is through the lens of uh, a WSIB representative. Um, I, I work for the Local 6500. I'm... Um, 
been doing this since 2006. Uh, we represent the valley workers. There's currently about 2,500 workers, uh, underground and surface workers. And we have, uh, it's estimated over 10,000 retirees, so we help them. Um, today's topic is near and dear to me as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, COPD, chronic obstruction pulmonary disease, uh, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, depending where you're from and pulmonary sarcoidosis. And, and the reason why this is uh, near and dear to me, uh, I'm third generation minor. So my, my father and both of my grandfathers, as well as my wife's father and both of my grand her grandfathers, all worked in the mining industries. And out of the six, uh, three of them had COPD, two with end stage COPD, and one had um, silicosis, which is, is uh, an IPF as well. And we currently have three wonderful boys, uh, two of which are underground. And the youngest at 20 will be underground in a couple of weeks. So I take a lot of uh, energy from from representing those from the past. But really, the ideal is to protect those of the future. And I think that really is the, the, the goal here today. So what is COPD? Well, COPD is, a, is an obstructive type of uh, disease, so it's the airways, the airflow, the bronchial tubes are inflamed. And if um, you ever want to feel what a COPD victim uh, feels is put a straw in your mouth, block your nose and breathe. And, and it's not just the struggle that you will feel, uh, you should really tap into your anxiety and how the body reacts on struggling breathing. So I, that's what COPD feels like. Historically, it was labeled as COLD, cold. Uh, even 30, 40 years ago, it was just emphysema or, or chronic obstruction, uh, obstructive chronic bronchitis, which is all under the umbrella of COPD. Um, COPD is, uh, the, the, the outcome of COPD really depends on the duration the intensity and the exposure types. All of these threes directly impact the level of harm um, that is caused to the lungs. So like anything else, uh, high doses, uh, in particular long, uh, small doses, and, and, and if you're exposed to uh, silica, for example, as opposed to just general dust, the exposure type impacts. So COPD is treatable, it's not, um reversible and it's usually progressive in nature and it always uh results in diminished quality of life and uh, unfortunately uh premature death so the causes of copd um there's non-compensable causes of course and smoking is at the top of the list the, it's it's estimated about 80 percent of of um people that have COPD and that were uh, past smokers are, are 80% is attributed to that, of course, pollution. And in our world, in the mining world and smelting world, of course, uh, sulfur dioxide and dust uh, in the mining world, in, in particular pre-75, the conditions before the Occupational Safety Act um, were deplorable, uh, to say the least, and uh, has improved, thankfully, but those workers in, in that uh, era has uh, higher risk. The um, harm cause, so when a worker is exposed to both the non-compensable and occupational causes, the, the harm is additive in nature. Um, not quite doubled, but additive. Uh, and the other thing that is interesting, uh, the harm that it's caused is medically indistinguishable. So which means the when you look at a, a person that has COPD, uh, their x-rays, there's no way that you could distinguish the harm that was caused by the cigarette smoke or the harm that was caused by the SO2 or the dust. It's, it's medically indistinguishable, so, which is important for to, to discuss my next slide. Or sorry, two from. So there's policy around SO2 exposures. So some of our smelter workers and refinery workers um, there's no policies regarding dust exposures. It, it really is uh, an entitlement criteria of, of 40 UGs per cubic meters. Um, 
and of course there's there's cases that have allowed for COPD for secondhand smokers in particular in the uh, restaurant industries where, where some of the waiters and waitresses that have went on to uh, get COPD but never smokers so there's there's uh, some interest there as well so for myself in in our world uh, at 6500 um, from 2006 to 2020 and the reasons why I took those dates is, is I started doing what I do back in 2006 uh, on a full-time level with the exception of, of a little blip but anyways in that time frame we had um, 25 cases of COPD, 21 of them have been allowed, two of them are still in um, appeals and I'm waiting a decision for two, we just initiated two. And out of the um, 21 that have been allowed, 14 have, have resulted in, in workplace fatalities and I call them workplace fatalities because uh, that's exactly what they are and, and the survivors are, are receiving benefits of that. Out of all of the cases, of uh, COPD that had smoking histories. 100% of them were apportioned by the WSIB. So apportionment really is is an application where they assign uh, a certain percentage of impairment related to the cigarette exposure and a certain percentage to the workplace exposures and they apportion the award. Um, they're not supposed to do that. We, we've objected to all of those decisions and 100% of those decisions have been overturned at the WSIB. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, the board applies the apportionment based on what they know as, uh, what they have an internal binder. We call it the COPD binder. So that's where they established some of the workplace causation, which was important, but it also uh, directs the adjudicators to a portion based on epidemiological evidence. Um, we know today that that's wrong, um, and this is really based on, on a Supreme Court decision uh, back in 96, um, known as the Atli and Leon versus Leonardi. So basically, you can't apportion an injury if, you can only apportion an injury if it's divisible. Um, and of course, as I was saying, COPD is uh, medically indistinguishable. So we had leading cases in the past. Uh, was he at 86592? And, and uh, Dave is very familiar with this. His fingerprints are all over this one. That was successful in arguing that apportionment is wrong. And then this other was he at this year in 484 back in 2009 said that using the COPD binder to apportion is reasonable. So that's been a battle till we had two leading cases, of course, 1884-07 and 1885-07. Um, these cases were long. It's, they started in 2007 and completed in 2016. But basically with the help of, of Okow and, and Dr. Hillier in, in particular, um, that really hammered the fact that it's one injury, uh, a single individual, indivisible injury, uh, therefore you can't apportion. So since 2006, there must be 70 plus WSIAD decisions out there overturning WSIB. As of two months ago, if I received a, a decision uh, of COPD and the worker was a smoker, they would apportion it. Uh, we thought that was really unfair. So we launched a complaint at the Fair Practice Commission back in May of 2019. Uh, and with this COVID pandemic, uh, everything else takes a lot of time, but anyways, long story short, as of September 1st, the Fair Practice Commission uh, called to inform us that WSIB has stopped apportioning, and as of yesterday, actually, they're going to revisit all um, cases that are currently in appeals uh, and, and overturning those. So this, this is a, a big win for, for injured workers. Interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, this is a restrictive type of illness. Um, so it's the lung capacity that is restrictive to the, the scar tissue. Um, and if you want to experience what that is like, I recommend that you blow into a paper bag, exhale and inhale, which really acts like your lungs. And if, if you um, clamp the bag in half, uh, and blow and exhale, that's that's what a person with pulmonary fibrosis would feel like. They just lose capacity. And the other devastating thing is the lung loses its uh, its ability to to oxygenate the blood. Um, so it's a it's it's a horrible disease that the workers choke basically to death. 
Um, 200 plus different types of pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, it's usually irreversible and progressive in nature. Again, really diminishes the quality of life and, and normally results in death. There's no policy in regards of COPD. So WSIB applies a test, what's known as a significant contributing factor. Um, although the work relatedness could be associated in all five categories, including uh, autoimmune and I'll touch a little bit on that uh, very few cases are are allowed because interstitial pulmonary fibrosis is often referred or diagnosed as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and in our world where we have to show that the workplace was a significant cause and if it's diagnosed as unknown cause uh, this is detrimental to some of our cases it's it's a huge huge uh, burden to overcome of course the exceptions of that is if there's um, silicotic or, or asbestosis in, in the lungs that helps. So again, from 2006 to 2020, we had 13 allowed claims. Uh, all of them had some levels of, of asbestos uh, signatures or, or silica signatures in the lungs, and that's why they were allowed. We have two of them currently under appeal, uh, which are in the hands of OCA as well, and I'll touch a little bit on that. And we have countless abandoned and denied claims because of the doctors are diagnosing them as, as idiopathic. So the challenge with IPF, of course, is exactly that, uh, is doctors really and treating physicians don't have time to understand OCK history. So they're there to treat the illness. Uh, they have 15 minutes with the patient, so ten, seven minutes to, to understand uh, where they're at and, and another seven minutes for paperwork. And there's really no incentive for the doctors to dive into uh, uh, history because the course of treatment is the same. So there's no incentive there. Uh, so going forward with this particular, um, OCAO has, has taken on um, two projects. Uh, one we were calling the Sentinel case, where it happens to be one of our, our retired members um, had a double lung transplant. Uh, and is alive and well, and hit a hole in one a month ago. He's, he's enjoying life, but there's pathology reports out there and slides of his lungs. Uh, and of course, the the worker is, is quite the historian and is capable to talk about his exposures. So this may be a, a great case. And of course, we're planning to publish a paper on IPF uh, capital letters versus IPF uh, lowercase letters, which really means. Uh, the the idiopathic has to be really, you really have to understand the worker's history before you can diagnose as a, a idiopathic. And the Occupational Cancer Research Center, of, of course, is, is taking this issue on and diving into that and are really demonstrating that uh, occupation and in certain type of industries, in particular mining, there's greater risk of developing IPF. Pulmonary sarcoidosis is another illness uh, which is uh, an inflammatory uh, disease. Most people with sarcoidosis have no symptoms and, and are rarely affected by it, but uh, in essence, sarcoidosis is an autoimmune disease. The board will tell you that there's very little scientific literature out there or the, the science is unclear of the causes. Uh, NIOSH has, has papers that that have been published uh, years ago, uh, and I have the title there that, that looked on specific to autoimmune disease and highly exposed uh, workers. And the American Thoracic Society published a, a, a paper as well, and their consensus, which is interesting, is uh, about 30% of sarcoidosis uh, patients uh, have links to occupation. 26% of those would pulmonary fibrosis and 14% COPD, which is an interesting find. Again, no policies on sarcoidosis, so the significant contributing factor applies. Uh, and in our world, uh, in 6500, in the, from 2006 to 2020, we have no claims that have been allowed, specifically to sarcoidosis. But we do have two claims that have been allowed for rheumatoid arthritis and two for sclerodoma, both of which are 
in the same umbrella as sarcoidosis, their, their autoimmune disease, and they are linked to silica. So not that it's impossible, but uh, right now sarcoidosis is a challenge. And because we had no real cases, I did a search, a tribunal search, and out of 24 appeals that I've looked, 23 of them were denied. One of them was allowed on an aggravation, but it wasn't really a true sarcoidosis claim. It was an aggravation base. So going forward, uh, a possible intake clinic. Ocal's not aware of that yet, but uh, <laughs> here's your notice. We have a, a group of underground miners, uh, a small group, uh, and they're all buddies, and they all suffer from the same sarcoidosis. And it really is our opinion that the WSIB and tribunal are behind times regarding probable uh, workplace causations. And, and if you look at the numbers, um, 30% is what the, the American Thoracic Society is saying, where I have zero. Um, pulmonary fibrosis, they're saying about 26% is work-related. I have a few. And COPD, where the Thoracic Society is saying is at 14%, uh, this is a very common thing. So everything is backwards. So there's lots of work to be done. Thanks very much, JP. Um, so, yes, uh, Ocal is working on... Uh, working on these uh, issues of sarcoidosis and uh, IPF uh, on a systemic uh, basis and uh, looking at them in the, uh, in the mining environment and other industries where, uh, where research is identifying uh, 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 much higher levels. And if you look at that ATS paper, um, you know, those are the, uh, the proportions that are thought to be work-related of all of the diagnoses for those conditions. Uh, so the uh, the percentage of the conditions arising in those groups of workers who have the exposures uh, that the research is pointing to as being the occupational causes uh, are going to be uh, even uh, much higher than that. And uh, um, uh, this really needs to be, uh, again, addressed at a, at a systemic uh, level of uh, gathering that information together. And uh, we're, uh, we're working on uh, both of those issues uh, actively right now. The next big uh, project that we are uh, working on is uh, GE uh, Peterborough uh, plant. So we had an, uh, an intake uh, uh, an intake clinic there, uh, which uh, uh, we've now seen over over 800 uh, workers uh, as a result of our work at that plant. And uh, we have uh, over 100 uh, currently active files, um, many asbestos-related diseases, including asbestosis, uh, which uh, some of you will know requires an extremely high level of, uh, of exposure, uh, as well as uh, numerous uh, cancers, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, work-related asthma, heart disease, uh, cancers of uh, many types, and uh, noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, and again, a key uh, turning point uh, in the way that uh, that whole situation was dealt with was the release of the, uh, the report of the advisory committee on retrospective uh, exposure profiling, um, uh, done by uh, or led out by uh, Dale and Bob DiMatteo uh, with a, uh, a group of retirees, uh, which uh, um, really changed the way that the board uh, uh, looked at things. Uh, Unifor also compiled a database of the underlying documentation, uh, um, including MOL reports, et cetera, and uh, OCAL began using that as uh, the basis for our work uh, on the interdisciplinary team uh, right away. And uh, the WSIB reopened all of the previously denied claims uh, from that workplace and uh, overturned um, roughly half of all the previously denied um, occupational disease claims. Um, there was a lot uh, there to work with. Um, we played a role in some of those in going back to find asbestos exposures that had been denied uh, um, for workers where the board was relying on um, uh, information faxed to them by the company about the different areas that uh, the worker uh, worked in. Um, and uh, just short statements there about there would be asbestos exposure in this area, but not in this uh, area. 
Um, the overall plank is 38 and a half acres uh, in the surface area, but um, largely without walls, certainly with not within each of the, the various buildings as they call them, and, uh, uh, and the ability of uh, exposures to travel uh, between the different areas but also just processes that were not uh, recognized uh, in the statements coming from the company, which were being made by people who had not even been employed there during the most relevant uh, periods. Uh, so for example, uh, one uh, example I recall, we, uh, OCAL, after the report came out and uh, we got access to the Unifor database, went back to some, uh, some of these uh, claims that were denied based on not enough exposure to asbestos, and uh, there was one area that uh, the board consistently denied the existence of asbestos in, but that included a bandsaw that cut uh, asbestos containing uh, boards. And uh, even, according to the uh, Joint Health and Safety Committee minutes, even after uh, GE had taken steps to eliminate the use of asbestos in the plant as much as possible and to take extreme measures where they did use it and uh, this bandsaw, um, it, the ventilation system for it did not have a, it was a vacuum that did not have a proper filter on it. And the levels of asbestos being kicked out uh, from the, uh, the ventilation system were in excess of, of the um, exposure limits at that time, which were super high and not at all um, uh, um, uh, well, they were super high, let's put it that way. And, and uh, uh, I think it's now uh, one tenth of, of what it was back then. Um, so clear uh, instances of missed exposures uh, and uh, many, many gaps filled uh, by this report and the uh, any accompanying documentation. Uh, there is a question in the chat looking for a, a copy of the report. Um, there is a, um, uh, a link to it on OCAO's uh, website in the resources section. Uh, you can also just Google uh, Google the name of the report there or some elements of it, and uh, it's still downloadable from the Unifor National uh, website. See, uh, Vani's put up a, a link in the chat for those who are interested. Um, there's also a link on the slide, which will be made available uh, as a result of the, uh, the activism of the GE workers, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, the way that they engaged with the, uh, the Minister of Labor at that time. Uh, we were able to, uh, to open an office in uh, Peterborough in September 2008. Uh, we have some uh, group reports uh, underway in various stages of drafting and have been in touch with local physicians, including a, a presentation by Dr. Karen, who uh, um, works at that uh, office to the uh, grand rounds of the Peterborough Regional Health Center and uh, um, meetings with stakeholders. Uh, now, this is currently in a state where it's uh, uh, the work is uh, driven largely by requests from the legal representatives. And our uh, focus at that office has been on the ventroplastics plant lately, but we're gonna be uh, returning back with some uh, more public facing events uh, related to GE uh, over the next several months uh, as well. So uh, here are a couple of the, uh, the developments more recently. There've been a couple of uh, tribunal decisions uh, that were released in March. Uh, esophageal cancer in one case and colon cancer in another, uh, where uh, Jason Patterson from the Office of the Worker Advisor was the, uh, the representative and uh, OCAO had uh, worked on them. And uh, they make reference to the, uh, uh, the advisory committee report. And uh, the significance of these is uh, that the, uh, the policy on gastrointestinal uh, uh, cancer uh, and uh, asbestos exposure not only sets out a length of uh, exposure to asbestos, uh, but also a, a level of exposure. Uh, uh, that uh, these would be uh, exposures uh, that would be uh, uh, the, uh, fall within the level of someone being an asbestos worker. Uh, so these decisions uh, by the same uh, vice chair, uh, based on this very similar, uh, you know, evidence applied in each uh, case, uh, did find that. Uh, the exposure in, uh, in uh, these large areas of the GE plant were asbestos worker uh, levels of exposure uh, that fell within the policy. 
Uh, there's also a, there's a side issue on the esophageal cancer that some of you may be aware of that despite the fact that it is covered by this policy, the board has a practice of uh, um, uh, not applying the policy to that particular diagnosis. Uh, but uh, when those are appealed to the tribunal, they uh, are, uh, are allowed under that policy. Um, Dr. Karen, uh, who, uh, who works at our uh, Peterborough satellite office, and he's going to address an issue that's uh, come up uh, with respect to uh, those GE workers. Uh, also was mentioned by, uh, to me by a, a doctor working on our uh, McIntyre powder uh, project, both of them uh, independently at uh, roughly the same time, the issue of lung cancer screening for uh, workers with uh, occupational exposures that pl place them at uh, extra risk of lung cancer. Good morning, everybody. Um, the issue that you've asked me to discuss today is lung cancer screening and what we're doing for at-risk workers. As, as we've all heard that as more and more clusters of illnesses are, are identified, then they, including lung cancers, the volume of voiced concerns are increasing by the day saying, what are you doing to, to look at this? So in order to impress upon uh, industry and particularly the ministry, we, we try to develop some real world dollar values because we don't know the numbers of, of uh, the occupational diseases in Ontario. But if we look at the costs at a glance, we, we, we look at um, the Compensation Board reported 231 occupational disease deaths in Ontario in 2016. Occupational lung cancer accounts for uh, about 60% of all occupational cancers. And then if we uh, rely on the best advice that we have at the moment, scientific advice, and we look at uh, people like the, the likes of experts like Professor Paul Demers, who says that approximately one in 10 occupational diseases are recorded as such, and therefore the real burden of occupational lung cancer could be approaching, if we use those figures, over a thousand cases per year in Ontario. And if we look at what way, what can we do to influence those cases, the research has been increasing dramatically in the last 10 years or so. And I just refer to even one uh, international study, the Nielsen study, and there's other peer reviewed that showed that life saving of between 20 and 39% of cases can be saved with early intervention investigations of possible lung cancer cases. And uh, these people, we're, we're looking at, if you again look at the dollar value and the people, we're looking at somewhere maybe in the region of 250 to 500 people whose lives could be saved by early intervention investigating or screening. And, and particularly the method that is proposed by these international researchers is low-dose CAT scanning, and more recently, again, by others with a blood test to accompany or precede the low-dose CAT scanning in these high-risk people. And if I look at the WSIB's own number, a death from lung cancer is a million dollars uh, cost to the WSIB system. And uh, a quite a staggering cost, and of course the, the tragedy uh, to the worker and their families. Uh, so our struggle to get real numbers is very important because if the ministry can see that they would save real money by early uh, uh, investigation and early screening, then we're on our way to saving some real lives in, in secondary prevention. We accept that these are the results of old, dirty industry, but indeed, uh, they are there for us now. So for, uh, our next slide, which is the burden of occupational cancers in Ontario, and this um, shows the, uh, lists some of the major ones like asbestos, diesel engine exhaust, silica, welding, and nickel, and of course, radon. 
So these are some of the workers who are at increased risk of lung cancer. They are not by any means the only ones, and as JP uh, was discussing earlier, any of the chronic inflammatory conditions of the lungs do in and of themselves increase the risk quite dramatically of developing lung cancer. So the fact that you have COPD is not just COPD, but you may well very quickly go on to develop a lung cancer. Now, some of the examples of the industries, uh, diesel exhaust, for instance, 40% in the mining group, which means that mining has taken a huge toll in people from diesel exhaust. And if I look at the example for crystalline silica, it shows again that in construction, it is uh, virtually, it will is a poorly controlled dust in the workplace and of course uh, also a significant cause of occupational lung cancer. So the, the presence, if we look at the, the Ontario and Canadian practices of preventative medicine, and Mr. Kalowski spoke about that earlier on, about that model, we don't have a method of early intervention or prevention in lung cancer. The present status is a chest X-ray, and I have went to the trouble of measuring the volume of what you can find on a chest X-ray as the early sign of a lung cancer, and it's about the size of a dime. And on a, on a CAT scan, and in a low-dose CAT scan, which means a lower dose of radiation with newer technology using the CAT scan, you can find a tumor or a spot in the lung the size of a grain of rice. And the volume of those two is very important because the volume of a, a dime is about 100 wow. times that of a grain of rice. So that the oncology people treating those tumors have got no hope in hell of managing tumors that are gone to the size of a dime it's too late, they're into stages three and four, which are terminal stages of lung cancer. So at the moment, Ontario has over the last several years looked at uh, heavy smokers and their pilot, the pilot objective and site locations for Ontario smoker study is uh, seen in this slide and the selection criteria are between 55 and 74, and you have to smoke cigarettes for at least 20 years. And the secondary selection criteria is that it would have to be an odds ratio of 2% or greater of developing lung cancer over the next 10 years, or six years. So you can see that there are several sites. Sudbury, the northern school, uh, the um, Ottawa Hospital, Lake Ridge, University Health Network in Toronto, and the Health Sciences North all are part of this study. It's been a very successful study so far. I've met several of the participants, and they, uh, they have uh, been generally delighted with the extra care and help that they're getting uh, dealing with uh, their smoking addiction, which is also a fact of life for workers. So this pilot objective has already shown to improve the outcomes, reduce death rates from lung cancer by about 20%. And if we refer back to the Nielsen study in a previous slide, women are in particularly uh, have a reduced mortality rate in their findings of up to about 39%, which means like four out of 10 women, if they are in the early screening program, should expect, if they are at high risk, to be able to find their lung cancers at a time when they are treatable and for people to be able to resume their, their daily activities of life. So the question then for us, is on our next slide is we are identifying workers groups. Dave has already referred to the General Electric Peterborough experience with asbestos and it was horrendous. That place in the wire and cable department, 
they brought in about 500 pounds of baled asbestos every day, and they carded it and wound it, and uh, workers repeatedly would describe it as if, like it was snowing in, those depart in that department. And of course, uh, again, as uh, Dave Wilkins was saying, there were no particular uh, junctions or departmentalization. It was one big, really, factory under a huge uh, cover of 37 or 8 acres. Well, also the Northern Ontario nickel, gold, and uranium miners, and you've heard from from uh, all of our northern colleagues, and Janice has spoken about it, JP has, and we, we know that they are at much higher risk of lung cancer, and those studies are already accepted by the WSIB. And we're starting to see other clusters, again, with the intensity that OCAO has uh, uh, put, has focused on other people such as Ventra, Pebra Ventra Plastic, Rubber Workers, and now, of course, the, uh, Nielsen, uh, the Nielsen Foundry. So these are all cases where we know that they're going to be at much higher risk of lung cancer, and we're saying, look, at, if they are, then we should be offering them this chance to uh, identify their tumors at an early stage when they can be treated. So unfortunately, when you do uh, do screening testing of the nature we're talking about, then the next slide will show that uh, we'll go through briefly the pros and the cons of low-dose CAT scanning. And I've heard physicians in the last few days speak about it, and I think the finger wagging about the amount of ionizing radiation from low-dose CAT scanning is, is, I believe, overstated. You're talking about four to kind of eight milli uh, sieverts per dose of low-dose CAT scanning, where uh, the background ionizing radiation for an Ontario person is about 30 milli sieverts. So we're not talking about massive doses of radiation. The old CAT scan did unfortunately deliver radiation levels that could be 400 times that of a chest X-ray. The present day radiation from a low dose CAT scan is approaching that of a chest X-ray, which has now been considered to be obsolete when it comes to doing lung cancer screening. And so does sputum cytology, which was touted for many years. So the pros are that the, the scanning equipment uh, for low-dose CAT scanning is now readily available. And uh, the, the early detection brings the, the possibility of highly treatable stages of cancer being found. And of course, the dramatic reversal of life-threatening cancer for the person. And again, having met several of those people who've had early cancers found with the smoking study in Ontario, uh, my feedback from their experiences uh, has been fantastic, and of course, for the quality of life for the worker and their family and their productivity. And on the opposite side, I've already talked a little bit about radiation from the low-dose CAT scanning, and while I am not dismissing it, I'm saying that it is not a major uh, barrier to proceeding with studies. But the false positive low-dose CAT scanning is always a problem. But they have managed to come around that with this Ontario study, and they are now starting to rely on tumorologists. So that's why I talked about the volume of the dime versus the grain of, uh, of rice, because the volume of the tumor is how the oncology people will decide how they're going to manage them. And that is really, really important. And the false positives have, they have the experience with the studies presently on, ongoing, both here in Ontario and internationally, is the false positive rates has dropped off quite dramatically as we've learned how to manage uh, nodules in the lung, and certainly at the four or five millimeter size and down. So the other problem is if you have a tumor that's on the borderline of possible malignancy and not, the invasive testing can bring its own health risks. But these have been well controlled for in the studies that we've been reading about. The extra doses of ionizing radiation I've spoke about. And uh, the worker anxiety during investigations is something that I can speak to personally, having interviewed so many workers over the years. And they say, Doc, I don't know what's going to happen to me next. 
So there's already anxiety because they know from, say, intake clinics or seeing the OCMED people that uh, they are at very high risk, so they're already worried. And I would say that my experience is that worker anxiety during investigations isn't that much different than what people are worried about anyway. So that would be the cons for it. Then the other interesting facet to early screening if for the next uh, slide, uh, thanks Andrew, will show. Uh, I've highlighted here a, an excellent study from Scotland conducted by Frank, Professor Frank Sullivan. Frank uh, was uh, an academic uh, appointment at the U of T Dalalana School of Public Health and then returned to Scotland and he has headed up a study of 12,500 people, uh, participants in Scotland in, in screening for high risk lung cancer, not occupational, uh, we're talking smokers. And I won't uh, bore or uh, delay the conversation, but it was a very significant study. They did blood tests, and these are autoantibody blood tests that are done by a methodology that has been internationally accepted and peer reviewed. And they were able to show lung tumor evidence up to two years before you could find it as a grain of rice in a low-dose CAT scanning. So really, the, the new screening uh, program for workers will have to discuss that to make sure that we are using the earliest indicators of disease while we can still manage it effectively and make it a chronic disease rather than a fatality. And so with the um, Sullivan paper, the early diagnosis of lung cancer, they did the randomized trial and they used the autoantibody blood test followed by imaging. And that to me would seem like a very uh, practical approach to dealing with the large numbers of questionable uh, developing lung cancer in our uh, various groups that we have identified at OCAL. And I believe that was really uh, the the points that uh, were, I was asked to develop as far as the discussion about this screening program and uh, the process to investigate. I've only put up two points, but really I think the next stage we need to have our stakeholder uh, people involved with OCAL to discuss how are we going to move forward to initiate a really first-class screening program that has already been shown to be such a a tremendous success internationally. And, and I think with what I've been hearing from the other partners, uh, including the, the uh, Ministry of Labor senior personnel, this I'm sure is very possible in the present uh, uh, environment of cooperative, collaborative work between the various groups. And I, I thank OCAO for taking on this secondary prevention initiative because I think it has a the possibility of saving enormous lives at virtually no cost, well, certainly huge savings to the province, but massive comfort to the workers to know that we can do something different about what was until now a hopelessly uh, managed disease and a, and a death sentence. And thank you very much. Thanks very much to uh, Dr. Karen. Um, I see we had some uh, some questions and comments in this uh, uh, as we go along. I, I'm not sure that we can really uh, um, answer those uh, at this point uh, in the sense that, um, uh, as Noel uh, pointed out at the outset, um, the, um, uh, the medical system, healthcare system as a whole, has really been taking steps to try to uh, restrict low-dose CT scanning <clears throat> to the criteria in the present pilot study uh, which are uh, revolve around smoking. Uh, so this is uh, precisely what OCAO is uh, um, uh, working on uh, on this particular issue is in trying to uh, a get workers who meet those criteria into that uh, into the screening without further delay, but also to uh, uh, to work on uh, expanding uh, the criteria to include uh, a realistic assessment of occupational risks some of which multiply the risk of, of lung cancer in smokers. 
Um, so uh, I think we have to uh, um, leave it for there today on the issue of uh, recommendations about uh, who should get a low dose CT scan uh, uh, and so on probably. But if there are other questions, again, if people can, uh, can put them in the chat, we'll come back uh, and do uh, questions related to this uh, whole Peterborough segment after we are done with the, uh, uh, the ventroplastics uh, presentations. So we've been uh, involved in that plant since uh, 2004. Um, and uh, our, our current number of active files is somewhat unknown. Uh, before we started our current process of uh, reviewing all of our previously closed files in light of new evidence uh, that's been received uh, and uh, identifying those, uh, those folks who needed uh, follow up and beginning to contact them and to do a, a remote intake procedure uh, where we first call them to see if they would like to uh, make them aware of the uh, historical exposure report uh, and uh, see if they want to uh, register with OCAL for further work than to get the appropriate uh, consent uh, for the collection, use, and disclosure of personal health information, uh, then to uh, update our uh, health questionnaires on those folks, and then uh, our uh, work histories as well. Uh, so that process is, uh, un is ongoing. Uh, before we began that, we had about 20 uh, active files from uh, Ventra. Uh, we've now uh, basically doubled that and um, uh, have a long way to go in that process and have not yet begun to actively um, <clears throat> put out uh, the information more broadly on a webinar such as this and uh, uh, to uh, absorb the new uh, intakes that that would uh, bring about. Uh, we have tentatively uh, set a date for an evening information system uh, that will be uh, um, looking at that process, looking at the exposure report uh, in some detail and at the uh, um, health concerns in more detail than we're going to today uh, for Wednesday, uh, October the 14th. Um, so, uh, and that will be advertised through the usual channels. There will be registration on Eventbrite. Uh, it would begin at 6.30 p.m. and also be uh, available on Facebook Live. Uh, we started in uh, 2004 in our involvement with the, this plant and um, uh, an intake clinic, and uh, that uh, gave rise to a number of, uh, a number of files. Uh, OCAL's procedure at that time was to uh, Close files uh, pretty abruptly. Uh, we've uh, uh, institutionally come to realize. Uh, so, for example, if OCAL filed a Form 8, uh, even in a cancer claim, um, the next step uh, in our procedures back then was to close the file, uh, which resulted uh, both in us uh, not knowing what happened with those cases uh, unless a, uh, the worker or a legal rep contacted us later. Uh, but also um, in uh, some people feeling abandoned because they got in the letter saying their file was closed. And uh, so they wouldn't even know that uh, uh, we uh, not only would accept them, but uh, wanted them uh, to, uh, to come back uh, if their claim was denied and they wanted to have a, an independent uh, eye look at the, uh, the, the reasoning underlying that uh, denial from a hygiene or medical point of view. And uh, really, you know, there's, there's not a lot you can say in a letter to somebody, which is one, what we've come to realize to uh, uh, just in terms of sort of fine print uh, to uh, uh, have those, uh, not have those feelings come up uh, when they feel that you prematurely close, close the file. So uh, we don't do that anymore. We keep the files open uh, as long as there is any possibility of uh, future activity and uh, make an effort to uh, follow up uh, to find out what's, uh, what's going on with the case. And uh, it was, uh, uh, I think, in retrospect, particularly uh, kind of um, uh, uh, sad to look back at the fact that some, uh, some workers from Ventra uh, felt, felt that way um, uh, because uh, they had been so helpful to us in all our Peterborough work, uh, including for the much, much larger uh, GE plant uh, it was actually uh, um, uh, local 1987 
uh, the much smaller uh, local that was uh, offering us uh, office space to uh, to see uh, workers and to uh, to meet about um, uh, um, uh, hygiene interviews and so on. And uh, you know we're very grateful for that. And uh, um, so I just wanted to uh, to thank Rose Wickman, who's the longtime uh, former, now retired president of Unifor Local 1987, for all of her assistance to Ocow uh, over the years, and to uh, to give her an opportunity to to, to speak for a couple moments uh, before we move on to our uh, our review of uh, uh, the historical exposure report. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ocow and Bob and Dale DiMatteo for all the hard work that went into our study and without the help of Ocow and Bob and Dale, we would have never got as far as we have today. Like Dave says, we started in 2004 because we actually started as a union a lot earlier than that because we've seen the signs of our workers getting sick, uh, very young, dying, uh, and never worked any other place but our plant uh, due to the certain chemicals we were working with. Uh, the health and safety regulations, uh, just uh, all different kinds of sicknesses, whether it's lung, whether it was cancer. And through the years, we're now seeing, since we've done our study, how bad it's been in the plant and how really scared we were at the time. And now we're just devastated to when we do a seniority list and we look at the amount of people who have several different issues from heart to lung to breast to total different cancers. And uh, we're, we're very proud of the hard work that went into this study. And uh, we could never have done it without OCAL. And we want to know that we're always there and we will be there, even though I'm not there no more. There'll always be room for OCAL at the local and we're, we're there to protect our workers and we plan on doing whatever we can. And I'd like to just thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thanks, Rose. Um... So we're going to now uh, turn things over to uh, to Bob uh, DiMatteo um, and and Dale, if she's going to uh, to speak as well to uh, present um, uh, the findings of that historical exposure report that the Ventra um, uh, workers have uh, have completed uh, together with them. Hi, Dave, uh, and everyone. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dale. Is going to start it off, and then she's going to hand it back over to me. Hello, everyone. Um, we're really pleased to share the hard work of the Pepper Plastics Advisory Committee with you today. This retrospective study of the Pepper Plastics plant in Peterborough was sponsored and funded by the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. It was undertaken to address longstanding occupational disease concerns of the PEBRA employees. This follows previous assessments by Dr. Roland Wong in 2000 and Sonia Lal in 2005, both employees at, um, at Ocow. PEBRA Inc. was a German auto parts manufacturer that set up in operations in Peterborough in 1986 in a 200,000 square foot ironclad building with 75 employees. At the outset, the company finished parts manufactured in Germany. Within a short time, the company expanded to produce multiple products from start to finish, employing over 500 employees until it went bankrupt in 1996. We will take you through phases of the study, including research methods, sources of data and information, and general findings. We will make some recommendations for positive change. Our work involved gathering information from multiple sources to recreate what, what historical chemical exposures were like. This involved reconstruct, reconstructing production processes and methods, identifying chemicals, work practices, tasks and flow of production, as well as exposure controls. We then engaged in detailed exposure risk profiles for each work process, and finally attempted to link exposures to the significant occupational illnesses and diseases that were reported at the plant. We applied a mixed method approach. This included a permanent focus group consisting of long-term employees and retirees meeting twice weekly over five months, supplemented with key informant interviews. In addition, we extensively reviewed plant and government documentation and consultant reports, as well as joint health and safety committee minutes and MSDSs between 1986 and 2000. We also conducted occupational hygiene literature reviews 
on the plastics industry, including chemical exposure and health studies. We applied a risk-based approach using basic hygiene concepts related to exposure risk in the hierarchy of controls. Concepts that have a direct bearing on exposure risks include physical states of chemicals used, volume handled, proximity, duration and intensity, work practices, work organization, health and self health and safety training, as well as worker access to information and exposure controls. Extensive group interviews and rich documentation provided an historical window into the company's quote unquote safety culture. This is a photo of two advisory committee members leading a, a risk mapping session. Risk mapping was used throughout, drawing on workers' experiences to recreate a detailed visual representation of the various production processes. There were many exposure risks that workers shared given the open structure of the plant, in addition to those related to their particular job tasks. These include, one, close proximity of workers to production processes in an open concept building, including a metal covered paint line in poor repair and open sluiceway carrying toxic waste to a sludge room that were major sources of air contamination throughout the plant. Two, massive amounts of solvents, glues, and thinners used, including PERC, TCE, MEK, and PEBRA-5 used continually in all work areas as a cleaner and glue. In addition to large-scale gluing and solvent applications, each worker would have their own supply to clean off tools and hands. Three, frequent cleaning and purging of all molding units with solvents and purging agents, as well as the spraying of mold release. Four, frequent large volume spills of paints, solvents, and glues as well as line and valve ruptures. Five, large amounts of dust produced daily from sanding, grinding, and buffing in major departments, worsened by the use of large standing oscillating fans and compressed air to clean off surfaces and clothing. Six, fugitive emissions from resin and solvent fumes caused by ventilation failures and frequent spills and fires. And seven, the common practice of eating, drinking, and smoking at workstations. Ever used and generated massive amounts of toxic chemicals. For example, in reviewing more than 300 M MSDSs, most products contained between three and five hazardous ingredients, in addition to combustion and decomposition byproducts. An environmental assessment of the plant ordered by the Ministry of the Environment in 1995 and 96 identified that PEBRA generated 1.5 million pounds of VOCs and used over 200,000 US gallons of paint annually, in addition to enormous quantities of thinners and solvents. The engineering changes made to improve environmental air quality led to worsened air quality inside the plant. Many of the chemicals used have been rated as carcinogenic, carcinogenic a mammary carcinogen, an endocrine disruptor, a neurotoxin, a fetal or reproductive toxin, an irritant, or a sensitizer. Such chemicals are capable of causing physiological damage to body organs, especially the lungs, kidney, bladder, liver, and brain. Most exposures in a plant involve exposures to a complex mix of chemicals. The origins of these, of these products are the result of chemical decomposition and, and combustion during thermal processing. Workers are routinely exposed to benzene, silica, resin dust, containing isocyanate residues, asbestos, vinyl chloride, phthalates, acrylonitrile, styrene, butadine, to mention a few. This chart illustrates the complex chemistry of polymer products. This is a list of chemicals used in the production process at PEBRA and the complex mix resulting uh, during production. Note the large number of decomposition byproducts in the right column produced various monomers and polymers undergoing thermal processing. From the time the, the chemicals enter the plant in the receiving department, so they are shipped out as finished products, there are a number of major exposure risks from workers involving all three routes of entry, inhalation, ingestion, and absorption, given the deficient exposure controls of the plant. I'm not going to go into each individual area. But each one, uh, each one of those uh, points uh, do produce, you know, significant risk factors. Other risk factors uh, were identified continually. 
uh, both by the workers, the inspectors, and by consultants. These include poor work practices, poor ventilation, absolutely very little exhaust, uh, local exhaust ventilation, heat stress, inadequate PPE, poor training and access to information, and a, a poor health and safety culture generally. The latter was exhibited by the company's extremely low scoring on a WCB audit, achieving a mere 100 points out of a total of 1,500. Importantly, <clears throat> workers were denied access to MSDSs and not provided with training. It took a massive work refusal in 1992, along with a threat by the Ministry of Labor to uh, post an inspector full time at the company's expense to eventually secure training and access to MSDSs. The chart that's up here is a, 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 a charting um, the ventilation flows in the plant. Uh, thanks to Sonia Lyle's previous efforts, we were also able to assess the air flows in the plant to illustrate how flaws in the ventilation system affected exposure risks. As well, there were there was a, a major lack of exhaust ventilation in the plant. <clears throat> Along with the pattern of disease claims showing signs and symptoms as the leading diagnosis and chemicals as the leading exposure, the following events lend support to the, con the contention that workers were being chronically exposed over the long haul. There were frequent individual and collective work refusals. In a number of instances, work refusals closed the plant down for close to a month. The Ministry of Labor noted that it had two file cabinets just dedicated to Hebra uh, work refusals. There were frequent mass hospitalizations. At one point, uh, the workers were bused in a school bus uh, to the high local hospital. There were frequent reports of dizziness, shortness of breath, sensitizations, obstructive lung disease actually de uh, diagnosed by the plant physician. Uh, and we're talking about not one person being diagnosed with this, but whole shifts. Uh, of, of sand and trim uh, workers. <clears throat> uh, there were many instances of workers losing consciousness during, this, uh, dur during these ordeals. These signs and symptoms are also frequently cited as indications of over overexposure and adverse health outcomes occurring well below the established OEL. I mean, many, of the, many of the signs and sy symptoms we came across really were actually reported in the MSDSs as indications of overexposure. This chart shows the disproportionate body burden sustained by plastics workers exposed to four major plastic resins and additives compared to non-work non exposures, i.e. the general population or control groups. Now, these, we, these were studies that outside of of, of this plant, these were other, other uh, research, other research uh, outside from our literature review. Uh, you'll note that there that that the work ex work uh, 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 body burdens were uh, extremely uh, higher than uh, the non non work exposures. Uh, in addition, these studies make a number of important observations with regard to bioaccumulation in plastics workers and the relationship between body burden and air concentration. For example, acrylal nitrile in urine was 11 times higher in workers and persisted on days off despite the air concentrations being below the OEL. Styrene in blood was five times higher in workers. Job test was the best predictor of body burden and is directly proportional to the extent of manual handling. Phthalates in urine, urine were significant, uh, there was a significant uptake of phthalates in, in urine, despite the fact that the air concentrations were not detectable. Phthalate metabolites were much higher in urine in workers than in the general population, while phthalates were below, phthalate in air concentrations were below the OEL. What do we know about occupational diseases at, at Ebra Ventroplastics? 
both reported and potential occupational diseases identified. This slide presents three sets of data identifying occupational diseases at Pabraventrum, including WSIB data that we requested between 1985 and present, uh, OCAL clinic master file data over the last 15 years, and finally, an exploratory disease count conducted by the advisory committee itself from the plant seniority list. We note the following observations you know, from this chart. The WSIB data of 301 occupational disease claims, 19 were for cancer, including six for leukemia, five for lung cancer, and eight for cancer groupings of less than five that couldn't be reported. Uh, <clears throat> fewer than five cancer claims have been lost by the board. Importantly, there's a pattern here too, which is important to note. The leading exposures are overwhelmingly reported in the, in the data as chemical, and the leading diagnosis was signs and symptoms, something like 135, followed by respiratory problems, uh, skin, and neurological disorders. The OCAL data registry shows 133 diseases. Now, these may be updated now, so uh, Janet can probably help us with that. You know, the OCAL registry shows 133 occupational, uh, occupational illnesses and 33 uh, cancers led by eight lung cancers and 26 others in groupings of less than five, which could not be reported individually. Other non-cancers non included asthma, COPD, neurological, and reproductive abnormalities. The advisory committee survey is also important, although these need to be confirmed. The Unifor advisory committee survey found 403 occupational illnesses, including 116 cancers led by lung cancer at 32, followed by breast cancer at 22, 10 cancers with no site indicated, eight kidney, seven GI, with 37 in groupings of less than four, which included thyroid, brain, skin, bone, lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, salivary gland, bladder, <clears throat> cervical, prostate, and pancreatic cancers. It's our view that the complex of chemical exposures in the plant strongly indicate that these diseases may be significantly related to such exposures. We found it hard to conclude otherwise. We'd like to just uh, run by uh, some recommendations flowing out of, out of this report. First, that the WSIB reconsider and review all denied and pending occupational disease claims in the light of the new exposure evidence in this report and the findings of Dr. Paul Demers' recent review of the state of the science and evidence on occupational cancers, particularly his exploration of multiple exposures and exposures to complex mixture. We also would like to see the board fund an independent investigation into the findings of excess cancers and diseases identified by Unifor Local 1987 Advisory Committee, that both the Ministry of Labor and the WSIB initiate and fund an inquiry into the role played by endocrine disrupting chemicals in the development of occupationally related cancer and other hormonally related cancers and diseases. And finally, that the Ministry of Labor and WSIB Institute an Occupational Exposure and Disease Surveillance System to the plastics industry, which is growing like leaps and bounds. Thank you very much for listening, and we take any questions you might have. Thanks very much, Bob and Dale. Uh, you know, so I'm sure everybody who's, uh, uh, who's on the call, who's uh, got experience uh, uh, looking at uh, um, the, the information that's usually available in a, in a WSIB file or uh, in a discussion about prevention me measures in a workplace 
can uh, can appreciate how uh, how comprehensive uh, that report is uh, just from this presentation. Uh, it's on our website. Uh, I'd encourage anybody who's uh, interested in the plastics industry or in, the, in this method of uh, proceeding uh, to look at it. Um, it's also going to be the uh, the starting point uh, from Ocow's point of view of our uh, major work on the nylon casting uh, cluster uh, is going to be the uh, the production of a similar report. Uh, the the steelworkers local uh, there has uh, been able to supply us with a great wealth of uh, documentary uh, information from that plant, uh, which has been closed down for uh, uh, well over a decade now. We're going to go straight to that uh, presentation. Uh, so Andrew Zarnke will be giving a more detailed presentation when we have our public info session for the Ventra workers uh, on the uh, on the 14th. Uh, and he'll talk about the also the contacts we've been making with outside researchers, such as uh, Nate DeBono at the um, uh, Occupational Cancer Research Center, who's been looking into both the plastics and the rubber industries, and uh, what uh, uh, what we're what we're hoping to to look at. A lot of the uh, reproductive outcomes, especially, really stood out when we went back to review our uh, our old. Uh, previously closed file. Oh, and there you can see uh, on that uh, on that slide right there uh, um, the, the, the things that we've uh, you know that just uh, sort of prominently stood out from our previous health questionnaires uh, that were on file uh, already from the, the previous intake. So, and we have a lot of uh, information gathering ahead of us still regarding those uh, health ongoing health conditions. Uh, so, but right now I'd like to go to uh, Jessica Montgomery uh, from uh, USW Local 2020 in Sudbury, uh, which is a, a composite local representing uh, workplaces other than uh, ballet uh, and including our uh, clinical staff at the, at the Sudbury Ocow Clinic. Hi, my name is Jessica Montgomery. I am from USW Local 2020. Uh, so I uh, will quickly go through this new long casting project as I know I am running into many of your lunch breaks. So I'm going to quickly go through uh, the history of nylon casting, what was manufactured, how this cluster came to light, known workplace exposures, uh, our initial response, the initial response from the community claims that we've already initiated um, occupational diseases that were discovered and really what's next for this project. Okay, so nylon casting was a foundry here in Sudbury, Ontario uh, from about 1974 until 2007. The foundry was bought and sold many times, so it was also operated under uh, Dana Brake Parts and Afinia Canada Corp. So during this time period, approximately uh, 2,000 of our unionized employees worked in this foundry. However, I will be representing uh, all of their employees that went through the plant, including uh, some management as well as contract workers. Okay, so nylon casting, uh, they manufactured brake parts. So they manufactured brake hubs uh, and rotors. So the foundry, they would buy uh, processed and scrap steel, which was then uh, fed into the plant. The steel was essentially then melted down uh, and impurities were burned off. Um, molten steel was then poured into silica molds of these brake parts and brake hubs. Uh, once the molds were cooled, they were broken off and discarded. So the project, the product was then run through a conveyor system in the plant where uh, more imperfections were removed uh, in our finishing and grinding department using uh, pneumatic hand tools. So the final product prior to being shipped out of the plant was then inspected uh, by our lab technician. So there was three uh, different types of labs uh, in the plant Okay, so how the cluster was discovered. So in December of 2019, I actually got a call from WSIB and they requested the assistance uh, for a past nylon casting employee. So nylon casting was far uh, be before my time and I we didn't have any information. So unfortunately in 2008, the Steelworkers Hall burnt down here in Sudbury. So we lost everything pertaining to nylon casting. So I did a simple Google search and found this Facebook group of past nylon casting employees. So I requested to join the group um, and the admin actually messaged me back and asked me like, did you work in the plant? 
what essentially were my intentions and I explained what was going on and I, I was welcomed into the group. So I made a post on this Facebook page and I said, listen, I have this past Neil on casting employee who worked there for approximately 30 years on the melt deck. What kind of things would this worker be exposed to? What was his job duties? And, you know, I was overwhelmed with the amount of support that I got from this uh, small group of workers who were essentially this little community. So I took all that information. I met with two past Joint Health and Safety Committee members who provided uh, all sorts of supporting documentation. So these weren't, this wasn't just like a couple pieces of paper. I actually received two large um, storage bin containers full of documents. So um, I'm very appreciative of Mike and Mike who, you know, essentially kept these documents for years and years. So that's great. And we have now supplied that to OCAO, um, who is reviewing those documents now. So I then put in two freedom of information requests to the Ministry of Labor. So I requested all complaints made to the Ministry of Labor, site visits, and what orders were issued. So that so we then received those and all of this information was supplied to the WSIB and the first claim was allowed. So that was great. I then posed the question in the group. So after going through the group, um, I found a ton of obituaries not just one or two, there was at least 25 of them. And they actually had a pinned post to the group where they were keeping track of their past members who had passed away. And I didn't think it was a coincidence that there was a number of workers passing away in their 50s when our life expectancy is far above 50. So I posed the question, who else was sick? And I actually had a ton of responses on this on this post and many workers were coming forward with various health conditions, but there was a lot of workers commenting saying that they'd been diagnosed with the very illness my first worker was uh, diagnosed with. So the workplace, our known workplace exposure, so this is what we have uh, confirmed documentation of so far, uh, is carbon monoxide. That is the biggest one. Um, so I have confirmed of documents reading, um, the highest level that I've seen in the plant was read at 1750 parts per million, which we know is far above the acceptable limits. Uh, silica is a big one, lead, triethylene gas, which they know as this TIA gas that actually caused the worker to have a blue haze vision. So they would have to often stay in the plant uh, after they finish their shifts in the parking lot until their vision was clear enough to drive home. We also have documents of isocyanides, uh, antimony was very high, as well as carbon coke. So this is just a small list of the known exposures in the nylon casting plant. So the initial response. So after I spoke to, you know, this group of 160 workers, I wanted to know more. So there was only a small portion of the past members on that Facebook group. Uh, so I wanted to speak as to as many people as possible. So the USW uh, District 6 actually put a post on Facebook stating that USW Local 2020 was looking to speak to past employees of Nylon Casting. So CBC and Sudbury reached out um, and I was actually interviewed by Angela Gemmel uh, the Friday morning after the Facebook post went out and that was at 7.10 in the morning. And by the time I got to work at 10 o'clock that morning, my voicemail box was full, full of voicemails of past employees who wanted to reach out. So this was great. Uh, this occurred every day for weeks. So in two weeks time, I had spoken to approximately 200 workers. And one month later, I've now well spoke, I've spoken to now well over 400 workers. So I received messages on all platforms, whether that be um, by email, uh, phone, social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, like Facebook, uh, Twitter, all it, it's coming on all platforms, which is great. So WSIB then reached out to me, uh, Jude, uh, Judith DeSuma, who is the director of the Occupational Disease and Survivor Benefits Program, reached out and we came up with, uh, you know, a strategy on how we would get these claims initiated. And we have a team now set up at WSIB who is directly dealing with uh, the Nilong group. So it's obviously continuity for these workers and their families and that these specific occupational disease uh, adjudicators have all of the information available to them. And, you know, it, it, I have access to them at all times, so which it, that's been, been fantastic. It's worked really well for us up to this point. 
Uh, so the claims initiated. So to date, I've initiated uh, so approximately 106 claims to this group. So this was made last. This slideshow was made, you know, at the beginning of the week. So there's probably a little bit more, a few more by now. Um, so claims have been initiated for various occupational diseases, such as, but not limited to, uh, COPD is the big one, lung cancer, mesothelioma, silicosis, hand arm vibration syndrome, or what we know as white hands as well as noise-induced hearing loss. So we've identified the following clusters, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that JP spoke of uh, about a little bit earlier, lung disease, um, lung cancer, respiratory illnesses. However, we will be investigating all health issues with potential links to the working conditions at Nilon Casting. So OCAL will be considering all the medical and scientific evidence to evaluate uh, the work relatedness. So our next step, uh, so WSIB uh, will review all of the individual claims that I've filed. They will gather all the workers medical documentation and begin to render decisions. Uh, USW will continue to do initial intake and administrative work to register workers to this group. OCAO's initial focus is to develop, to develop a retrospective uh, exposure profile of the production processes at the Neil Long Casting facility. So OCAO will be working with a committee of, of past employees. There's approximately seven of them um, who are, you know, past health and safety reps and unit presidents and unit chairs who, you know, have a long um, work history at the plant. So that's that's going to be that's going to be amazing. Um, OCAO will also do individual claim file work, which will commence once WSIB has rendered the decisions and USW Local 2020 will be the designated worker representative for those claims. So regardless, uh, union, non-union, uh, management or contractors, uh, we will be representing uh, these workers. Thanks very much, Jessica. And uh, it's, uh, um, uh, well, as you can tell, uh, Jessica is super organized and a great partner for us in uh, undertaking this project. And uh, I know uh, all our staff in the uh, Sudbury area are looking forward to it. And uh, we're going to also have uh, one of our uh, hygienists from uh, Toronto, along with one from uh, uh, Sudbury, working with the uh, with the committee and uh, with uh, Bob and Dale on that retrospective uh, exposure report. And uh, um, I want to thank everybody for uh, sticking with us. We still have uh, over 80% of our uh, original participants. Uh, which is great. Um, if anybody wants to stick around uh, and ask questions about uh, anything that's happened in the last uh, portion of this, uh, feel free to put them in, in the chat. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we'll uh, shut it all down uh, once and for all at 1230 um, regardless, but if there are some more questions, we could, uh, we could tackle those right now and, uh, whatever we've skipped over tonight, we will find a way to present it at another forum. Uh, please remember as well that, uh, next Friday and for the next, uh, four Fridays, I believe we have our continuing October events, uh, in the morning from 10 to 12 next week, uh, Paul DeMare is presenting his report on, uh, occupational cancer adjudication. Uh, at the WSIB and policy making, and uh, I think we uh, can all look forward to that. He's uh, he's a great presenter, a very thoughtful, uh, uh, very thoughtful uh, fellow. Um, uh, although you know nobody's going to agree with him on everything, um, and uh, yeah, uh, so we'll. Uh, let me just check the chat. Also, there's the survey on the survey monkey. We always want to uh, to improve to make sure that uh, the format uh, is uh, is appropriate. That uh, uh, that uh, people are uh, um, also any other topic areas you're interested in hearing from in future OCAO uh, um, uh, webinars. Throw those into the comments and so on. But it'll be very helpful to us if you uh, complete the survey. Okay, yeah, it looks like we're not going to have any further questions, so we'll uh, uh, we'll wrap it up now. Questions. Jennifer, do, are there any other? Oh, sorry. Yep. Oh, hi, Dave. I, I was just going to yep. uh, uh, just note that I, I think the work that Jessica did here is just amazing, and uh, that'll make life very easy, <laughs> really, to put this stuff together. You. Know? 
Yes, yes. Thank you. And uh, as I said, we already have uh, a ton of documentation that she's put together uh, uh, to uh, to work with uh, at OCAL, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to working with her in the future. And uh, this is just uh, the tip of the iceberg, too, of the uh, the workplaces where uh, we've been asked to provide assistance or where we know that uh, there are upcoming closures that um, uh, where uh, uh, an intake uh, clinic would be useful to document people's uh, work exposures and health conditions, including a couple of very large non-unionized workplaces uh, that we are uh, looking at how we will, uh, how we will engage uh, with those uh, situations. Um, at some future point, uh, we will uh, uh, talk again about the uh, the broader map of uh, what we know is out there in terms of uh, occupational disease clusters and uh, what OCAO's uh, plans are uh, once we have uh, more knowledge of our uh, funding situation going forward. Goodbye, everybody.